Hi there everyone, today we're continuing with Unit 2 of Higher Biology. In this video we're going to discuss the environmental control of metabolism, which is key to 6 of Unit 2 Metabolism and Survival. So just to start off with this topic, we're going to talk a little bit about microorganisms, their uses in industry, and how we can successfully grow them. First of all, we need to have an understanding of what microorganisms are. Microorganisms are very small organisms, which are usually unicellular. They can belong to any of the three domains of life which we have discussed before, either the eukaryotes, for example, slightly more complex organisms like algae and yeast, they can be bacteria, such as E. coli, or they can be members of the archaea, such as methanogens and fermophiles, which are organisms that are able to survive in really extreme conditions, such as hot springs and deep sea vents. So they're very, very varied, and there's lots of different forms of microorganisms. So the important thing here, though, is why are they important to us? So microorganisms are able to produce a range of metabolites from their metabolic reactions, which we find useful. In fact, many industries are absolutely reliant on using microorganisms in their processes. So for example, in the production of medicines, we use microorganisms to make vaccines and antibiotics. In the industry of food, drink, enzymes, microorganisms are essential in the production of cheese and alcohol. So think of mouldy cheese or the production of ethanol through the fermentation of yeast that we discussed beforehand in the unit. There is also an important use of breaking down sewage and toxic waste into harmless products through a process called bioremediation, which we use microorganisms for as well. Now, although they are useful, there's reasons why we like to use them in industry. For example, they are very easy to culture on the whole. They can reproduce and grow very quickly. Their food substrate that they use is often very cheap to use or to buy. They produce useful products like we just discussed, and they're also highly adaptable. So they're very useful, there's lots of advantages, but now we're going to have a look at how we can actually grow these microorganisms in industry. So as we've discussed, microorganisms can be cultured or grown relatively easily in a laboratory. However, to ensure successful growth, they must be provided with an appropriate growth medium and carefully controlled environmental factors. We're going to be looking at these two different things individually because they're really important for the growth of these microorganisms. So in terms of this growth medium, which is what the microorganisms are grown in, many types of microorganism are able to obtain energy from light, such as photosynthetic microorganisms. However, most microorganisms in industry require a chemical substrate to generate their energy. Think of it like being given food. This is where growth medium comes in. The most common example of this is an agar plate, which you've probably came across or seen before when you're maybe using swabs or growing various microorganisms. Agar is a gel made from seaweed, which acts as a growth medium and contains the nutrients that microorganisms need in order to grow and to survive. Again, there are big differences between microorganisms, and some of them are able to produce all the complex molecules that they require. However, there's other microorganisms that need even more complex compounds to be added into the growth medium to ensure their survival as well. So in terms of growth and survival, as we've already said, the growth medium is the substance that microorganisms grow on and it can be full of all the nutrients that a microorganism needs. However, this is not enough to just ensure the survival of the microorganisms. We also need to strictly control environmental factors which can affect them. What we need to control is the temperature, the oxygen levels, and the pH levels. They can't get too low or too high. We also need to make sure that the microorganisms are grown in a, in a sterile or clean environment to make sure nothing else grows which could affect them. So in terms of these environmental factors, how do we carry this out? The diagram on the right shows the industrial process of growing microorganisms, and it shows a variety of mechanisms to ensure that these environmental factors are controlled. So the first one we're going to look at is sterility. The use of aseptic techniques, using filters, and using steam ensures a sterile environment. As I've said, this reduces the growth of any other competing microorganisms, and it also reduces the risk of spoilage. The use of water jackets and a thermostat are used to both monitor and control the temperature of the uh, growth process. The main need to maintain the temperature is to keep the organisms, or to keep the enzymes rather, at their optimum temperature. 
As we know, if temperature gets too high, the enzymes will denature and the process will stop. Too low and the reactions will be too slow. So it's important that the temperature is kept at its optimum level. Oxygen levels are important for aerobic respiration to occur, as we have covered in the second key area of this unit. Uh, for aerobic respiration to occur and to avoid fermentation from taking place, oxygen is required, and this is added to the process through air inlets and a paddle to circulate it. Finally, we need to keep pH levels at an optimal level, just like temperature. This entirely depends on the microorganism we are using. For example, most bacteria grow around a neutral pH of 7, while fungi usually prefer a more acidic pH of 5 or 6. In order to keep the pH at its optimum level, we use something called a buffer to stabilise the pH, or we can add more acid or more alkali in order to keep the pH at the level we want throughout the process. So make sure you know which environmental factors we control and how we go about controlling them. So if these microorganisms have the required growth medium and all the environmental factors are carefully controlled, we should have the conditions for successful growth. The growth of microorganisms can be plotted through four different phases, as we can see in this graph. This is made up of the lag phase, the log phase, or the exponential phase, where we see a significant increase in the number of cells. There's a stationary phase, and then finally, morbidly, there's a death phase. We're going to go into a little bit more detail into these four phases just next. So first, we concentrate on the log phase. This is where enzymes are induced in order to metabolize these substrates. There's no real growth going on here, but we're preparing for the growth of microorganisms and for the population to increase. Next, we have this increase. We have the log phase, which is a rapid growth of microorganisms due to plentiful nutrients and the right conditions for growth. And we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how much this increases. However, as we continue, we hit the stationary phase where there is no real change in the population. This is because the nutrients that were so plentiful in the log phase are now being used up and also toxic metabolites are now being produced. There are also secondary metabolites that are being produced, such as antibiotics. Now in the wild, this would be a great thing for microorganisms, as by producing your own antibiotics, you can outcompete other microorganisms. And we term this advantage an ecological advantage. And finally, we get to the suitably term death phase, where due to the accumulation of these toxic metabolites, or by all the nutrients in the growth medium now being used up, the microorganisms die out and the population number obviously decreases. Now, if we go and plot a graph of microorganism populations, you can be dealing with extremely high numbers. Ideally, the rate of population increase doubles at each cell division, which accounts for the exponential growth you can see in that log phase. So in order to deal with these numbers and this rate, we tend to use semi-logarithmic scales in order to produce and interpret growth curves. So this is something you can come across in problem solving past paper questions. So it's worth having a look at them so you can get used to what they look like and interpret them yourselves. Now, finally, we're going to quickly summarize the two different ways that you can count the cells in a culture. So if you ever have the unenviable ta task of counting the number of cells in a sample, you can come across two different ways of doing this. There's a total cell count, which is exactly what it sounds like. You count the total number of cells in a sample, including both the live and the dead cells. However, Often through the use of dyes, you can distinguish between live and dead cells, and you can use this in something called a viable cell count. In a viable cell count, you can only count the total number of living cells present, so you do not count the dead cells. Now, a viable cell count is especially useful when referring back to the phases of growth, because you can tell when the death phase is taking place. You would know it was the death phase because the number of living cells would be decreasing. However, if you performed a total cell count, you would not be able to tell it was the death phase because you would also be counting the dead cells that were there as well. And that's all you need to know for this key area. So make sure you've went through this video and you're comfortable with what a growth medium is, what environmental factors we need to control and how we go about it. Also make sure you can tell which phase of growth is taking place in a graph and the differences between the two different types of cell counts. So thanks very much for listening, everyone.